Lovely. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I have a dilemma with compliance and integrity, um, and I think I need to declare up front that as a public rep and a politician, <laughs> it's very difficult because people say to me, how can you be a politician and use the word integrity in the same line? My role, though, as a presiding officer of parliament, one often tends to find that the focus on compliance drives a certain behavior. And it might not be ethical, the behavior, because it is merely done to tick the box to ensure that you get that clean audit. So the big question I'm grappling with is, does a clean audit necessarily equate to service delivery, or does it talk to good governance, and, and, and? But we need to move away from compliance to where integrity is entrenched in the framework. And sadly, we have the AG who comes around, and we all know the AG says you've got to tick this box, you have an annual performance plan, but your APP doesn't measure integrity, it doesn't measure ethical leadership, and to me that is the dilemma. So I liked what was shared by the speakers earlier. We need to build a new framework that is less focused on compliance, but more focused on values integrity and ethical leadership in every aspect of the business whether it's procurement supply chain whatever it might be we need to start revisiting the role but I do want to make a very contentious statement because I've shared the platform before with the, the panelists and sometimes we are actually preaching to the converted and I think the time has now come for us to take this conversation out there to where it really matters to the individuals who should be held account, and I consider myself one of them. And I am here today because people say, what do you do as an MP? And I say, I'm here to try and make a difference to ensure that we change that stig stigma and stereotype that exists. It's not going to be easy, but everyone in this room, by just being here today, you have already made a commitment that you are willing to help to start that conversation that talks to integrity. Thank you, Adley. Well answered and not covered quite a lot of what we wanted to know. Um, now, integrity is means different things to different people. So I'm going to pose this question to both Faisal and Charissa. Um, does integrity have the same meaning across all cultures? Faisal, there's a mic for you there as well. Should I start there? Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Adley, that's an interesting question. Uh, I must state that uh, due to time, uh, Adley's uh, cut the program down. Uh, so there's some questions that's out there which I wanted to link later. So I'm going to uh, rather tell the story in a story, as Professor earlier on alluded to the fact that through fables, we can we can teach and impart the story. So that's what I'm going to do very briefly. Uh, however, I think that it means different things to different people on a continuum. So I see the peripheral aspects of integrity being slightly different. But like I said in a previous sitting, that there's a continuum of this behavior. And in the center of that, the morals and values remain the same. If we look at the very definition of the word culture, it, it, by definition, it means that there's a difference in the way that we understand and perceive things. So this means that it defines a people or a society, and that can be slightly defined differently on the side. Obviously, all cultures might not agree with the fact that perhaps something as serious as rape is good behavior at all, and I don't think any culture does that, but there are peripheral aspects on the side. So I see that answer as being sitting on a continuum. But I think it's more apt to talk about creating the culture of integrity instead, which then becomes um, a, a system inside all cultures. I want to relate a very brief story, and uh, I would like you to focus on this and I'm going to get through it as fast as possible uh, because it's a very critical story and it will show you the path of how things perhaps lapses, if I can call it that. Uh, this, is a, this is not a religious story of any religion at all. It's simply uh, an example. And so I'll just uh, stick to the generic aspects of this. So one day we have 
a saintly figure, a saintly person. And he never wanted to go into the court of power, meaning parliament or <coughs> the king's court. He never wanted to go and mix his behavior, which he thought was saintly, because he felt that the courts and the, the house of power was corrupt. So his mission was never to enter into the king's court. The king heard about this and he gave a challenge to the people. He said, I challenge anybody to bring that saint into my court at his own will. Uh, then the devil, as it be, came up with a plan. So the devil said, remember this is a story. The devil said, you know what? He posed to somebody else and he said, I've got a plan to get the saint into the king's court. So he appears to the king and he says to the king, if I bring the saint into your court, then what will I get? And he made an arrangement, this is going to be the payment, whatever it is. So he's getting that. The king had a daughter, a princess, and the princess came into contact with this devil. So the devil's idea was, make the princess sick so that they can visit the saintly person because the saintly person had this healing ability. So they need to see the saintly person. So the devil appears to the young girl and she falls ill. And the devil then goes to the king and says to the king, you know, I need to take her to the saint because the saint can heal her. So there they go, horse and cart. It's, I'm thinking it's 500 years ago, horse and cart, they go off. <coughs> and the saint solves the problem. Two months later, the devil is again busy with the princess and she falls ill again. But this time he starts prompting the king, telling the king, you know, we keep on going up and down. We might as well leave the princess, the sick princess with the saint. So once she heals him totally, then send her back to the, the, the palace. The king agrees, but the saint disagrees. The saint says that, you know, I can't do this because I'm not married. I cannot have a strange female in my area so it's not going to work be that as it may the king convinces the saint that why don't we then build an outbuilding or house next door and we'll put the sick princess inside there you can solve the problem and then send her back lo and behold she then lives next door but one night as the saint takes her some food the devil appears and the saint sees the young princess clothing fall off and naked. So now obviously the action starts. The Friday night TV story starts, you know. So um, the act happens because the saint says in his mind, I've never committed any sin, but I'll commit one sin and then I will repent. So he does the deed. Okay, his deed is done. Next morning he repents. He's back up there. Daughter goes back to the, the palace. And the and Satan then comes and he says to every everybody, not to everybody, but he says to the saint that there's a problem. The princess has fallen pregnant. Now this is if you think about the Tudors and all that kingdoms, they're gonna cut they're gonna take your head for something like that. It's as simple as that. So he says to to the saint, make an excuse for her to come back here, to come and live here, we can solve the problem of her pregnancy. She comes back, stays at the saint's place. But he visit, the devil visits the, the saint again and he says, you already committed one sin. The issue now is, and you repented, why don't you murder her? And once you murder her, you bury her under this tree. And once you bury her under that tree, you know what? She's going to repent again and the problem is gone. The saint says, you know, that's a good idea. I'll just do this, repent, back to normal again. He does that murders the girl, goes back the next morning and repents and life continues. But by now the devil, his plan is in action. He goes to the king and he says that, you know what, I know where the daughter and the princess is. She's buried under the tree at the saint's house because he murdered her. So there the, saint, there the king goes along with his old cottage, pulls the saint out, takes him on trial and sentences him to death. But here's the big catch. As the saint stands on the gallows, the devil appears to him one last time and he says to him that, and I'm almost at the end, Adley, <laughs> he says to him that I've tried to help you in the first instance. I tried to help you in the second instance. But if you bow down to me now, then I'll save you from hanging. And the saint bows down and the noose is pulled and he leaves this world a great sinner. The moral of the story is 
that this is a domino that we're talking about. Simple. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. That's so many lessons in that little fable that you told us there. Charissa, your take on um, integrity across cultures. Hadley, I'm, thank you. I'm going to keep mine really simple and really short. If we're talking about doing the right thing, and obviously every single culture has different ways of doing things, but here's my thing, it's simple. If honesty is part of integrity, can we actually say that some cultures are a little less honest than others? Mm. And we can't do that. So honesty needs to run right through no matter which culture it is. For me, it's, it's as clear cut as that. And it, you're right, it really is that simple. Just do the right thing, whatever your culture is, and don't use culture as an excuse. So do the right thing. Um, Prof, I'm going to come to you now. Um, I'd like to know from you, and you've, you've touched on it in your, your presentation, but um, what is the value of doing business with integrity? So what's the value of doing business with integrity? And how does this impact on profitability? Well, doing business with integrity guarantees the sustainability of your business. Um, the violation of integrity pays temporarily, but eventually the cost is more than the gains you would have gained through um, your unethical conduct. Let's say, for example, you get involved in corrupt tenders because you feel that your company um, is failing to make the necessary profits, temporarily you're going to shoot to the skies because you're doing well. But what eventually happens when the truth comes back, you lose even that which you worked for. So that's the importance of uh, doing business with integrity. But also doing business with integrity, as I indicated earlier, builds trust. Because if, for example, I cheat someone with you, yeah, I, I, I do a, 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 a business deal with you, but you are aware that I've cheated X. You're, gonna, you're not going to trust me because you'll know that when I'm with X, I might be cheating you. So it, it creates a, an environment of lack of trust and that creates tensions in society and that has led to the fractured world that we have where there is a trust deficit everywhere we go. Thank you for that. Um, just going on with that thought, the speaker coming back to you now. So how can we get organizations to be integrity compliant but across all levels? Actually, that's a difficult question because um, integrity and compliance in my world are almost conflicting. Um, I, I look at integrity, I look at accountability, transparency and everything else, but too often our code is driven by compliance and we cannot enforce integrity on people. So we would need to, we would need a culture of integrity to be embedded in that system and I said that in my earlier statement. but. A simple lapse, one lapse, can be the cause of your demise. And it's often we see it happening, often in, in corporate as well as in the public sector. And despite the fact that we might have codes of conduct, I've actually just done some research and I, I attended recently the Public Service Commission uh, sort of had a pledge signing. But what does it help to sign a pledge if you can't actually live that pledge and give effect to it? So the cost to the business, to the institution, and in fact the cost to brand South Africa today, the impact is huge. And it started possibly with one integrity lapse way back then. So I would like to believe that if we have a compliance officer, if you have a code of conduct, the basics must underpin that it cannot be driven by compliance. It must be driven by the need to act ethically. And for me, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. 
And if we can get that culture going, then we can say we're on our way. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And again, it is so simple, just doing the right thing at the, not, not necessarily at the right time, but all the time, specifically when nobody's watching. And it's so, so simple, as Chirissa said earlier. Faisal, I'm coming back to you now. Um, what do you think of the... Um, of having integrity ambassadors in the workplace? What are the pros and cons of having also an integrity department in a workplace? Would it work? Wouldn't it work? I, I do think there are, there are pros and cons, depending how you look at that. Uh, firstly, uh, the current integrity, the being the definition, being the, the quality of being honest, and the ethics part being that contained in a manual that guides your, your behavior from an external perspective. I think that an integrity ambassador personifies what we find in this discussion and it personifies what we find in the book. So it then brings to life because it's difficult for human beings to sometimes follow what's on paper, but when that is embodied in a person, then that would be easier from an exemplary perspective. However, uh, th the part that I have a problem about around that is the fact that if that integrity ambassador is put up there on a pedestal and the picture is up in reception saying this is your integrity ambassador and it's wearing he's wearing the company flag and tag and everything that person is perfect for all the time and there comes along this devil that i spoke about earlier on and and penetrates that person's mind for five minutes and there's a collapse do we then see other staff members becoming despondent saying have vested all of that mm. not into the institution of integrity but into that personification and through that when that falls do I fall too so that is my concern about it it's a difficult one that but do you think um, there is a need for um, integrity ambassadors I know we should all be integrity ambassadors I, yeah now it's a, now it is a difficult one <laughs> I think there is a need but perhaps uh, some great minds in this room, uh, Sharissa from a mental health perspective and many other psychologists and psychiatrists and legal minds can perhaps find a balanced working formula to say, uh, here's the working formula that puts that person there, controls that and doesn't allow you to collapse when that person collapses. So I don't know what that answer is. Good. Teresa, I'm going to come to you and you can answer that question in your the next uh, question that I'm going to ask you um, because it relates. Now, do you think that an integrity leadership training can play a role in preventing corruption and moral decay? Thanks, Hatley. Yes, most definitely. Because the the training is inspirational and it inspires people to be aware. And it's, it's self-reflective. It's asking them and questioning themselves at the end of the day on what level of integrity am I sitting. So it's about self-leadership and it starts with oneself. And coming back to the uh, ambassador, I, I love the idea to actually have an integrity ambassador. It was my idea to actually come up with that. And there will be lapses. We are all human. We are going to make mistakes. We are going to fall back. But if we could have someone who's a role model, if we look at professor and, and speaker and all of them, they're role models for us. And it inspires everybody else and themselves to live a better life. And to take integrity not only in the organizations, but to self-reflect, to take integrity in your communications, in your parenting, in your home life, in every single aspect. And having a role model there is someone that they can look to, someone they can go to, and someone that can, can ask questions to as well if they're lost along the way. So that, that is my belief. And through my training, the little bit that we've just got started, I found it has been beneficial because it's been, the focus is on the team, not on me coming up there and giving you a PowerPoint and saying, this is integrity and this is what you need to do. It's asking the group, what do you think it is? How do you think we can improve? Where do you think your organization can improve? So um, I may be biased, so but I definitely, yes, feel, yeah, I definitely yeah. feel yes, most yes. definitely. And we need to have more of that. And Speaker, you wanted to explore a little bit on that? So, I just wanted to touch on internal integrity. There are two aspects in my mind. Internal as in personal or You have an internal integrity, and that is getting people to trust you, but you actually need to trust yourself. And then external integrity is not only about your business, but how your employees behave. Because if they lack that internal integrity, it, it can absolutely destroy your brand. But how do we get internal integrity going in a society that is broken? And one must acknowledge 
the imbalances of the past. I grew up on the Cape Flats and, and I work with an NGO uh, called Partners for Possibilities and we work in schools where we're doing trauma-informed care. And the simple issue of integrity, um, I think Prof might have related the story uh, of the young boy who took the pencil and the ruler and uh, was was taken in and they called the father and sadly the father was a teacher and then he said now why did you sneak a pencil and a ruler I could have brought this home for you so that talks to internal integrity and how do we manage ourselves as individuals and again we're preaching to the converted here but I do believe that we have to take this conversation out there and and as a public rep I am saying that not all public reps are frauds or corrupt Quite, or yeah. whatever it might be there are many good public representatives out there but the media will tend to focus on those who do the bad and the ugly and the corrupt and I think it is going to take a whole of society approach to get all these public reps into a room or possibly start the dialogue where we start letting them holding them to account as civil society and saying we are actually funding your salary we have tasked you to do a piece of work you got to stop what's happened yesterday in Parliament and actually get on with the business of serving and delivering on a mandate so I'm passionate about the subject but I do think we've reached the stage where we need to take it out the room now and to take it Quite. where it really needs to where, where our voices need to be heard and we can bring some more integrity ambassadors on board thank you Hadley can I jump in sure. there I think well said speaker when we sorry I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here <laughs> when we're talking about internal integrity I just want to say something it's really hard to work with integrity because there's a lot of work that has to go on in your mind all the time and you have to question every single decision that you make every single thought that you have it has an impact on someone and that internal dialogue we need to start talking about and we need to start training the young people but as well that we don't just do that we stop and we reflect what will happen if should I do this it's hard work and it's about teaching others how to self-reflect and think before we act and think before we speak then just keep the mic at your um, and then how do we apply integrity in our everyday life um, in our relationships and communication I think, again, using the same words, it's through self-leadership. It's through questioning ourselves and, and wanting to actually make that shift, wanting to be a person with integrity, because as I said, it's hard work. And just making that decision and making that decision to be role models for others, for our children, for people around us, because integrity is contagious when we actually see someone with it and look and we follow them and with all the moral decay and what we want leaders with that. In, and your leader doesn't have to be someone in a high profile. Mm -hmm. It can be anyone in your everyday life as well so I think we need to first make the decision do we want to live our lives with integrity and uh, and then how can we improve it if we walk out of here and ask ourselves on what scale of integrity do I think I'm at and how can I improve it and do I want to and let's go back to just saying if integrity is doing the right thing then I'm very concerned for society because a lot of us are not doing the right thing and if we did the right thing then for me there would be less rape less murder less abuse less bullying because we would be taught to do the right thing and a true word spoken there by you when you said a lot of us are not doing the right thing even though we think we do and we pr pretend that we do but we're not really doing the right thing prof can i come to you now um maybe you can just help us but but by by answering me this question so how do we prevent and inspire organizations to become resistant to corruption thank you um the approach that I presented earlier starts with leadership because leaders inform the culture of an organization and when corruption is endemic it is a leadership issue and so you, you have to inculcate the right leadership ethos and in our case from the Tumor Foundation we encourage leaders to be epic, ethical, purpose driven, impact conscious and committed to serve and I'm going to highlight the impact conscious part which is leading by example because you can as a leader say I want an organization built on integrity and preach 
to your staff, integrity and to your colleagues. But I think what people will remember is what do you do? Are you trustworthy? Are you honest? Do you keep your promises? Do you take what's not yours? And things like that. And I agree with Sharissa that integrity ultimately is universal. Issues such as trustworthiness are universal. Uh, honesty are universal. Where we have problems will be ethical dilemmas. So to an organization, I would suggest for you to reinforce integrity, you do need a code of ethics that indicates how should people behave. Because how do we know you have integrity? The only way we know you, you have integrity is when you behave ethically. Because integrity is inside you. But with what you do tells us you have integrity. If you behave in a trustworthy way, way, if you do the right thing, but what would be the right thing? And the right thing would be you are just, you are fair, you don't steal, you don't um, uh, engage in, in conflict of interest, you, you keep your promises. Thank you. And again, once again, it's so simple and so basic just to do the right things. And, and it's things that we should learn from cradle to the and keep to the grave. Mm -hmm. Speaker, um, have you got something to say? Because I'm going to come to you next. My, lo my last point on a code of conduct, a corporate culture of integrity must be intentionally shaped. And the basis of that is authenticity. You have to be authentic and true to yourself. I cannot be Shana at home and the speaker at work and, and live this uh, split persona. It doesn't have to be that way. And too many people lose sight of what it takes to be authentic and to keep it real. And to me, that is core. You cannot kill the cat and your husband and fight with the children at home and then you want to come to work and preach integrity. It, it just doesn't work that way. So you've got to walk your talk and you have to be absolutely mindful of your behavior at every time. And, and people know me. Many people say, don't go near the speaker because she will not address anything that is remotely um, unfair or inappropriate. So I suppose it's, it might be a good or bad thing, but the fact that people know me to be principled and down the line, whether I am at home or whether I'm at work, certainly says something around being authentic. I do have my failings, but I do try and lead by example. And as a leader of an institution, I need to set the tone from the top. But sadly, we cannot account for other people's yeah. integrity lapses because ultimately they need to be mindful and self-aware of how their behavior affects not only themselves, their family, their personal reputation, but the institution, the political party, the corporate company that they belong to and represent. Thank you. Now keep the microphone staying with you, seeing that, yeah, she, those wise words. And I love the fact that you say it should be intentionally shaped, which is true. So what do you, or how do you see the future of integrity and, and ethical leadership? How do you think it will look like in the future? Hadley, I remain the, per, the eternal optimist. Um, and as I said, I, I work with education and I believe that we need to start the integrity conversation at grassroots level. And it is about responsibility. And I'm going to touch on something that happened yesterday. Many people might know Guy Fawkes that was celebrated. This, this has taken on a really ugly turn. And I popped in at the school that I look after and the principal indicated that 254 learners were absent from school. But the reason they were absent was not because they wanted to come to school. They were threatened that if they went to school, they would be beat up. Now, since when has Guy Fawkes become an, a topic and what is the accountability of the parent and also the role that education plays. I mean, a teacher or principal can't go all children out of an informal settlement. So there, 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 there is something fundamentally wrong and we cannot expect 
teachers to raise children when parents have abdicated their responsibility. And I really do believe we must address the socio-economic ills that yeah. exist, but we also need to begin to take accountability and start teaching integrity. And I have a 10 year old grandson. You know what he thinks of politicians? And I'm going to quote this. He once saw a red team throwing water bottles all over the place. And he said, Nanny, are you safe? I said, yes, I'm going to be okay. He said, Nan, I think their behavior is appalling. You should put them in the naughty corner. <laughs> now that's a 10 year old. What example are we to our children if we cannot as public reps manage ourselves and this is why i believe integrity must be must be taught mm. in your home through ecds and i'm very pleased to hear that the western cape education department has actually taken on integrity as one of of their anchors and and that's tremendous it bodes well for the future but again it takes a whole of society to fix the mess we currently find ourselves in thank you you know what i'm going to make that our final question but i'm going to pose it to every one of the panel here. So let's go to Faisal. Same question. What do you think your vision of integrity will look like in the future? They call this place utopia normally. But uh, I realized at some point in my life that I'm not certain I have this idealistic vision sometime, hoping, expecting things to happen a certain way and it doesn't. However, at the same time, I think that I would rather use the time to say that I think we need to take and look at what Neil Armstrong said and is to take that one step so that we can all take that giant leap. So I see it in that way that if we all leave a room and all of us talk to five other people and five people talk to five people I'm, and all of us, there's one thing I've been doing um, and I think Sharissa and Madam Speaker, you know it very well. Uh, some people ask why am I that brutal on TV? Why do I call people out? Why do I just not care what I say? Uh, that's, not, that's not the issue. The issue is that we too many times sit by knowing things are happening, seeing people doing things, and then you ask why did it happen to me when it happened to me, but that's because two weeks ago you allowed it to happen to someone else. So I want to see a world where we all start speaking out, whether that's TV, I can't talk about your neighbor on TV that's there that's busy doing I don't know what with a cat next door. You need to be able to say that, and I think that if we all do that, that's my idealistic approach for it to say, let's all start saying that big word, no. Thank you. Same question, Pref, your vision for, for uh, integrity in the future? I believe the future looks better than currently. Great. Firstly, adversity can be a gift. And when it comes to integrity and social justice in this country, adversity has been a gift. Because uh, when it comes to social justice, for example, after Bell Portinger, which had a, an element of playing on social injustice, to do something that lacks integrity, but it taught us to do something about social justice. Now we're battling with integrity. A lot of our companies are going through pain. A lot of government departments are going through pain. A lot of our leaders, nationally and internationally, are going through pain. But in the process, organizations and people are beginning to look at how do we improve leadership? How do we improve our incentive system? How do we train and um, teach people about right and wrong? And ultimately, how do we review and refine our systems to make sure that when there are integrity lapses, the systems are able to correct things? Thank you. Teresa, do you want to wrap up your vision for integrity in the future? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, speaker, you spoke about fireworks, and that's a very sore topic for me. If any of you have seen my Facebook page, I was a bit um, adamant that what people aren't realizing, and I've asked Tozi to speak, that when we're talking integrity, we need to take it through to animals as well. And when we light a firework, a cracker, animals get terrified. A lot of them are actually running, escaping, running into traffic. Um, it, the most horrific things are happening. Birds are flying into the windows. Animals escape. They get burnt. They get horrific things. And 
Are we doing the right thing for a little moment of a cracker to go bang? What has happened to our society in terms of that kind of compassion? And I'm very sorry today that some of you saw that it was a vegetarian meal. I take full responsibility. You can blame me because I wanted us to have a day of integrity where we do not take cruelty to our plate. Although, forgive me, I think cheese and any radical vegans would get to me for that. But so for me, um, we're doing the right thing. Even when we go back, we didn't talk about social justice as well. Prof, when I was in your amazing social justice round table, and we were talking about, and sorry, I'm trying, going to try and be brief, but I have to say this. We remember that wonderful doctor that spoke about, I've forgotten his name, and you can correct me. Uh, Professor Bauman. Yes, Professor um, Bauman. And he spoke about, and I just want to relay that because I get shivers when I speak about it. Remember that time? Um, two ladies were going from church, and uh, excuse me, I've given the facts and they were driving from church or to church and it was raining and they were in a terrible head-on collision and one of the ladies and I forget her name the driver was really badly injured and she was bleeding and the other one wasn't as badly injured and she kept saying please help my friend and they didn't understand why they didn't help her friend so I get emotional when I hear this and eventually the passenger got wheeled into the hospital and she said well what happened to my friend and as she saw that she saw the ambulance drive past and it said forgive me whites only and then he ended up saying prof didn't he say he said and that lady was my sister and she was 25 years old and for me I got such a wake-up call because I'm not going into politics in that whole era but if people were doing the right thing did you let somebody die because of the color of the skin? Where did we go wrong? And we can start unpacking this and get emotional about it. That was not the right thing to do. They should have just put her in the ambulance. So for me, Prof, when we start talking about the connection between social justice and doing the right thing, so my future before I get even more emotional about this is I want a future where integrity becomes the key word, Absolutely. where it becomes sexy, where people want to have integrity because it's current and it's important. But not only that, the most important thing to me, and I, I'm speaking with passion because I've sacrificed for this, I want people to stop throwing the word around and understand what it means and be able to apply it in their everyday life. That's where I see it. And I see us taking, thanks to Prof and I'm sure to Speaker and everybody else here, I want us to have our first South African Integrity Forum where we can unpack this and starting to make this go global. Let's not talk about integrity and we do not know what it means to apply in our everyday life. Sure, I sound like a preacher. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I get a bit carried away from Thank you, Teresa. And as she said, why can't we make integrity sexy? Let's all make integrity sexy. Let's give a big round of applause for our very informed and wonderful panel.